Um, first, I want to just mention this work uh, was done over at Eurocom in collaboration with Siemens and the Ulm University. And with this, let's just right step in and get started. So I probably don't even need to mention like our daily life gets more and more reviolent on embedded devices. So they are really important and in turn their security is pretty important, right? And the vulnerabilities which we have on those devices are go, going far, far beyond just uh, the things we see very easily like weak authentication, hard-coded SSH keys and so on. And another completely other category of vulnerabilities present are programming errors leading to memory or the possibility of memory corruptions in the end which turn out to be exploitable sometimes. A very popular method, and we also saw it already in the first talk, to discover those kinds of programming errors is fast testing. And really a lot of work is dedicated into input generation and fault detection for fuzzing on desktop systems. But if we go to the embedded world, the question is, are we really fuzzing embedded devices efficient? And can we do it better than we do it now? And, um, oh, sorry, one slide back. So with this, let's talk a little bit about fuzzing, corruption, and crashes in general. The main starting point for this work, even encoded in the title, is uh, the well-known fact that a memory corruption is not uh, inherently equal to an observable crash. However, in turn, most fuzzing techniques which we are using are relying on visible crashes, detectable crashes. And as we point out, especially on embedded uh, devices, we often deal with uh, silent memory corruptions. So corruptions which will not directly turn into an observable crash. Um, for studying this a little bit more, we first, uh, in the first step, decided to make a small classification of different kinds of embedded devices because there is really a huge variety and people like define embedded devices in tons of different manners and we went here for an operating system based uh, classification with the intention that operating systems are already bringing like some basic security measures or building blocks for advanced security measures with them. So we denote as type 1 devices general purpose uh, operating system based devices. Um, those can be for instance found in home routers running Linux systems, maybe with a stripped down libc and a busy box instead of GNU utils, but in essence it's a full-fledged operating system. As type 2 devices we denote uh, devices which have uh, operating system which was customly tailored to the needs of uh, the embedded world. Um, for instance, to deal with scenarios where there's no memory management unit available. And those kind of operating systems are found on single purpose user electronics such, such as IP cameras or DVD players and so on. As type 3 devices, uh, we define more monolithic devices with no really uh, observable or usable operating system abstractions at all. I mean, it may be that there's a hardware abstraction layer present, but in the end of the day, the resulting firmware is basically just one huge binary blob present on the device. So looking at those different kinds of devices, we basically lined out three distinct uh, challenges uh, applicable to the scenario of fast testing uh, embedded devices. The first challenge is very related uh, to the fact that memory corruptions can be silent, um, fault detection. So especially type 2 and type 3 devices often lack uh, basic features which are used for turning memory corruptions into visible crashes, like a memory management unit which will give you segmentation faults if you access invalid memory, or uh, advanced heap consistency checks uh, provided by your favorite libc or even hardening measures which are by now widely deployed in the uh, desktop world may just not be present in the embedded case. And due to that, it's often the only solution which we have to when we fast test embedded devices is to perform basic liveness checks. In fact, we already saw this like in the first talk of the session where we just, or where in the work the embedded device was uh, just pinged or it was looked if the TCP connection timed out. So this is oftentimes the only way to uh, measure whether an embedded device had, have, has a corruption or not. However, it may be that a just uh, undetected memory corruption is present. 
The second challenge is uh, performance and scalability. Like fuzzing really, really, really benefits a lot from the possibility to fuzz in parallel, to have multiple fuzz sessions at the same time running. In the embedded case, this will mean we need one device per fuzz session because we need the physical device to test in most of the cases. Additionally, we need to restart the device. Once we crashed it, or uh, every now in a while to get a clean state, we need a restart. This is also very good for, or very well doable for desktop systems, but for embedded systems, restarts can really have a duration up to several minutes uh, frequently. So it's not really scalable at this, uh, at this point of view. The third challenge is uh, instrumentation capabilities. Like a lot of work on fuzzing uh, relies, for instance, on coverage information. I mean, uh, I guess everyone is familiar with uh, AFL. For embedded devices, we cannot easily retrieve this information. And likewise, uh, tooling, or widely tooling, which we use even for desktop software to turn silent memory corruptions into observable ones, such as address sanitizer, may not be available for embedded devices because the instruction set is not supported, for instance, or um, the operation of the tool is tied to specific features brought by the operating system. And now that we have outlined this different challenge, we studied uh, actually the effects of different kind of memory corruptions. So we took five common types of, of uh, both spatial and temporal memory corruptions and inserted them into popular open source programs which we found on embedded devices in the past, uh, namely Embed TLS and Expat. The trigger condition itself were uh, inspired by the LAVA work, so there were certain triggers to actually yeah, uh, have the corruption appearing so that we have a controlled environment. And the vulnerable uh, programs itself were compiled by us for four different devices, ranging from a desktop-like device to uh, a type 1 device or type 3 and type 2 device. So looking at that, uh, we got the following table. Um, the check marks here, the green check marks basically mean, uh, okay, there was an observable crash. The red uh, crosses mean, okay, we couldn't detect the crash. The device was, for instance, just happily running or continued to run, even so we triggered the corruptions and we know that we triggered the corruptions. Sometimes we had like uh, behavior which could be interpreted for the one side or the other side, for instance, a hang of the device or a crash which occurs way, way, way later in the execution. So the takeaway from this is the farther we get to the embedded side, the harder it is to actually have a memory corruption observable or the more frequent are silent memory corruptions. And with this knowledge, we started to look into, okay, how can we improve this? What kind of methods and tools do we have already available to uh, make this better? Um, we investigated six different methods, mainly uh, static instrumentation, binary rewriting, physical rehosting, full emulation, partial emulation, and hardware instrument, uh, hardware supported instrumentation. Uh, we analyzed which pre requisitories they have and in which scenarios they are useful. And for the second part of our work, we mainly focused on full emulation and partial emulation based scenarios because uh, for our case, this were uh, the best fitting candidates. Which brings us to the actual second part of the work, leveraging partial and full emulation to improve fast testing. So this is more or less the general setup we used uh, for, analog or for, for carrying out this part. So we have at the core a fuzzer, boofers, uh, which sends fuzz input to, embedded, to an embedded device, which may or may not be partial emulated, with uh, Panda running different analysis plugins, and we have Avatar 2 uh, orchestrating this full setup. And um, let's talk a little bit about the actual fuzz target. So we used the vulnerable and instrumented expert program, which we saw in the first part of the talk, and we focused solely on a type 3 device with the intuition that if we can detect or can, if we can detect faults on a type 3 device by extension, we should be possible to do the same for type 2 and type 1 devices. And we carried out fuzzing sessions in four different configurations to measure performance overhead and fault detection. So first, we went fully native. So we executed the firmware just on the embedded device. And this is more or less like the classical way how you would fuzz an embedded system. The second um, configuration is partial emulation using Avatar 2 and Panda with memory forwarding. So parts which we cannot emulate, we forward to the actual physical hardware. 
The third part is again partial emulation, but this, kind, uh, this time with peripheral models. So we manually constructed simple models of the peripherals which we cannot emulate, and we don't need the actual hardware anymore, but we don't have very complete models. And the third part is the full emulation example where we basically just more or less rehost the complete firmware inside a Panda and don't have any interaction with the outside world. And as um, additionally, the further setup is, uh, or the further we used is Bufas, which is a uh, um, Python-based fuzzing framework based on Sully. And we set it up to, to trigger the different corruptions with different probabilities or with a different ratio compared to inputs which are not triggering uh, the corruptions. And in total, we did uh, 100 fuzzing sessions lasting one hour each for all the different kind of configuration and uh, fault detection scenarios which we employed. Because now that we have, uh, oh, well, first, in the native case, case, we don't have any other fault detection mechanisms than the basic liveness check. But as soon as we go and have Panda in the loop, we can actually uh, define several analysis plugins which help us uh, yeah, for fault detection. So we implemented six simple heuristics which are mimicking already present techniques uh, present uh, in the desktop world. And we implemented them as passive monitors during the execution. So there's no instrumentation of the actual binary happening. And using those six heuristics, uh, actually a subset of the heuristics, we were able to successfully detect the different kind of vulnerabilities we inserted during the fast session, uh, compared while only using liveness check around 50 to 60% of corruptions went undetected. And one um, especially interesting result I want to highlight here from this is uh, the fuzzing throughput we had in the different scenarios. So here on the x-axis, we denote uh, the different corruption ratios in percent, lasting from 0 to 10. And on the y-axis, we denote uh, the number of inputs uh, sent during the one-hour fuzzing sessions. The dashed lines are um, the setups where we had uh, the heuristics enabled, so they introduced some performance overhead, while the non-dashed lines are just uh, fast normally without, um, without any heuristics or um, analyzers in place. So what we can see here is uh, firstly, and very interestingly, that under the scenario of full emulation, we can even perform better with a better performance than when we run on the actual device. This is due to the fact that the emulator, even through emulating, were able or were running at a higher clock speed than the actual physical device. Um, additionally, what we also see is that partial emulation with uh, memory forwarding is very, very non-performant um, due to the fact that you need to interact a lot with the actual hardware. And in the middle, we have the partial emulation with according models, which uh, actually was a good compromise and trade-off between both worlds. So this um, concludes more or less uh, the things we did. And let's see a little bit of what, what we actually learned, what are the takeaways. Take so first and foremost, I want to stress, I believe or we believe that liveness checks only is a poor strategy because a lot of corruptions would, get, would be undetected. And partial and, or full emulation can really help us during fuzzing, but it's very not often available. And partial emulation itself is already helpful, but introduces already a significant performance overhead. And some limitations. We focused uh, mainly on improving fault, uh, fault detection and other challenges of fuzzing, such as input generation, are not addressed in this work. But as we see, the community is also working on those topics. Um, furthermore, we focused on artificial vulnerabilities because we wanted to uh, improve our basic understanding of the way how we fuss embedded devices and how can we go get better at it. And we only investigated solutions based on emulation and the other directions which we pointed out are also still open for investigation and future work. And yeah, with that, I want to conclude the talk. Fuzzing embedded devices would or does actually need a shift in paradigm. And emulation is good, but good emulators are rarely available. So we should also look into how to get to better emulation. And in general, the topic of fuzzing embedded devices is uh, not exhausted yet. Thanks. Sure.
Um, yes, so in this case, we actually deployed uh, mechanisms to automatically reboot the device. However, we had uh, snapshots uh, once we started a farthing session. So we create a snapshot and uh, fuzz from the snapshot. And every X uh, fuzzing inputs or, or fuzz uh, interactions, we would reboot the embedded device just to be sure that we have, again, like a clean state uh, also on the hardware peripherals, which are hard to monitor. Uh, for your heuristics, uh, do you have a graph of which heuristics were more effective? Uh, slash, uh, how do you know uh, where, st where the stack objects are from the firmware? So um, we have in the paper actually a, a table which um, shows like with which kind of heuristics we could detect which kind of corruption. And very predominant here is uh, the segment tracking heuristic, which basically is uh, like software re-implementation of a memory management unit. Uh, this already is, is quite helpful in that case. Thanks. Okay. So I guess my question is related. I may have missed it, but did you have a slide that showed your detection rate for the four configurations? Uh, the like you, 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 show, you showed the kind of the detection failure rate like with you know just regular uh, native trials, but not the four. Well, this doesn't show the detection rate, right? Uh, no, so the detection rate uh, is actually also like uh, more more elaborated in the paper. Okay. Um, he, yeah, you mean so, this so like, like th okay. this chart, but for the four configurations is what I was saying. Yeah. yeah. That's, okay. uh, it's in the paper? It's in the paper. Okay, yeah. all right, thanks. Okay, so uh, that's the end of this session. Uh, one quick announcement.